Greetings once again to all of our listeners. The happy Sabbath to you all. The subject for today's presentation is God's Battle Axe. God's Battle Axe. And uh, the, as some of you know, or most of you know, we are right in the closing stages of the great controversy. This huge battle that is taking place in this universe and the earth is only just a little small part of it. Okay? But this battle when Lucifer wanted to take over heaven and he was finally cast out from heaven ended up on this earth where the great controversy has continued to this day. So the subject is about man's part or how does God want to use man in the great controversy, God's battle axe. Okay, let's uh, start with a word of prayer, then we'll continue. Our Father in heaven, once again we come before you to worship you and to praise your name. We thank you, Father, for your goodness, mercy, and long-suffering. Thank you for providing for our needs. Thank you for your protection. And we commit this program into your hands. Let your Holy Spirit be our teacher. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. I'll be using some sharing some quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy, the writings of Ellen White. The first one is Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, Chapter 2. Before the fall of Satan, the father consulted his son in regard to the formation of man. They purposed to make this world and, be, and create beasts and living things upon it, and to make man in the image of God, to reign as a ruling monarch over every living thing which God should create. When Satan learned the purpose of God, he was envious at Christ and jealous because the Father had not consulted him in regard to the creation of man. Okay, so we can see here that the rest of the universe, heaven, and, you know, was already created. And man, or, and this earth and man was created later. And it was during this very time that Satan was jealous of Jesus. How that jealousy came up, don't ask me. But uh, the Bible does mention the mystery of iniquity. When something is a mystery, that means it can't be explained. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 69. Leaving his place in the immediate presence of the Father, Lucifer went forth to diffuse the spirit of discontent among the angels. He worked with mysterious secrecy and for a time concealed his real purpose under an appearance of reverence for God. He began to insinuate doubts concerning the laws that governed heavenly beings. Okay, so when uh, Lucifer started to get this uh, kind of attitude, this jealousy, uh, he started, he wanted to spread it amongst the rest of the angels. See, Lucifer himself, he was created an angel. Okay. And that's why God cannot get him to enter, you know, into like the running of this universe because angels are created beings. Jesus is different. Okay. So he worked with mysterious secrecy. See, evil, sin, rebellion, they flourish under secrecy in the start, just to get a hold. Later, then it can come out in the open. 
And uh, this is something to consider because, you know, even today you have these secret societies. And when something is done in secret, then, you know, that should ring a bell, something wrong somewhere. And so from being jealous with Jesus, now he's starting to insinuate doubts concerning the laws that governed heavenly beings. So now he's starting to go against God himself, the Father, God the Father. Okay, and he's he's trying to undermine the laws of God. However, just to sum up what happened next in the Great Controversy, page four nine five, when this was taking place, God already knew from the beginning that Lucifer was starting to turn. But anyway, long was he retained in heaven. God bore with him, you know reaching out to him, hoping that he would repent and change and be on track again. Again and again, he was offered pardon on condition of repentance and submission. Okay. But pride forbade him to submit. Friends, when you look in the book of Daniel, you can find it in Daniel chapter 4. Pride hardens the heart. And so in, when God tried to help him and, you know, get him to repent, uh, he refused. Right. What happened next? Revelation 12, verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. So the dragon is like a symbol for Satan, and he managed to deceive one third of the angels. Michael is another name for Jesus. The meaning of Michael is one who is like God. Okay. So all the angels had to choose whose side. So this, the great controversy now, it started in heaven. Later, it transferred down to planet Earth. And so there was this fight. When you, this war, in the Strong's Concordance under war, the original Greek word is polemo, and it means argument or controversy over doctrine or belief. So first of all, it was like a debate kind of thing, argument. And then later it was a literal war when Satan and his angels were cast out of heaven. Okay, verse 8. And they pre and prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So by this time, the earth was created and Satan and his angels, they came down to this earth. And in fact, uh, let me just read a verse. It's not in the PowerPoint, but... Uh, just to link up with his thought, Revelation chapter 12, verse 12. And therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell on the, in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And so when the devil and his angels down on this earth and a voice cries out from heaven, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because now Satan is down on this earth. And he's been here ever since he was cast down. And um, now we can see why there's so much woe in the world today, crying, tears, suffering, okay, because of this great controversy. Review and Herald, February the 11th, 1902. Uh, when God's uh, purpose for man, all heaven took 
a deep and joyful interest in the creation of the world and of man. Human beings were a new and distinct order. They were made in the image of God, and it was the Creator's design that they should populate the earth. Okay. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7. The purpose for men, everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. So man was made to glorify God. Okay. Uh, it, when, when God made man, he made us with a free will. Okay. Not to be like robots, we are unthinking. No, but the freedom to choose. And one third of the angels, they abused that freedom. They chose to follow Lucifer. Lucifer abused his freedom. And many of us, we do the same. So that's what the great controversy is all about. Whom will you choose? Whose side will you go on to? You know, Michael or Lucifer? Jesus or Satan? God created man for his own glory, that after test and trial, the human family might become one with the heavenly family. It was God's purpose to repopulate heaven with the human family. Okay, so God created man. Now, God knows the ending from the beginning. And I believe that God, when he made man, he knew what was going to happen. I mean, he knew about Lucifer's fall. and uh, But even though he knew it, he still never affect our freedom of choice. Okay? Uh, we still are free to choose which side we're going to join. And so, for those who after test and trial, you know, who come through, on the side of God, overcoming sin, these are the ones that God will use to repopulate heaven with the human family. Okay? Remember, with one third of the angels coming down, there is space in heaven, space there. So that was God's purpose for creating man. The vacancies made in heaven by the fall of Satan and his angels will be filled by the redeemed of the Lord. Review and Herald, May the 29th, 1900. <clears throat> now, coming back to the creation of this earth, God made Adam and Eve. Angels visited them in the Garden of Eden and told them of the fall of Satan. Angels would warn them about the apostasy taking place within the rebellion taking place in Satan's heart. And uh, <clears throat> so when, you know, when they were in the Garden of Eden, they were, they were warned, warned. But uh, anyway, they, they ended up committing sin. Okay. Now, when Satan first rebelled against God, the question, why didn't God destroy Satan right away? You know? And the answer to this question is, the onlooking universe had no idea of sin and its consequences. So God let it unfold to reveal Satan's true character. Okay? Uh, when, when it happened, the, the angels, the inhabitants of the universe had no idea at all about sin. It was a completely new kind of thinking. Rebellion. Nobody had ever done it. And its consequences. So God had to let it unfold and let people watch and they learn. And so at the end of it all, when they see the awfulness of sin, 
no one will want to play around with sin anymore. So God just let it continue to reveal Satan's true character. And another, and another thought here, that when the thing unfold, the universe would witness much more revelation, deeper revelations of God's love, God's dealing with sin, and how he was willing to forgive those of us who repent. You know, if sin did not come in, we would not have that extra revelation of God's love. So you, so we can learn about Satan's true character, and we can learn more about God's character of love. And another reason why God did not destroy Satan straight away is because God has a system in place to deal with uh, false allegations, rebellion. It's there, right there in the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 16. <clears throat> this was the procedure that God gave to his people. If a false witness would rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong. Okay. So this, this, uh, this was what was happening in heaven. Lucifer was a false witness rising up against God. So this what had to be done. Verse 17, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judge, judges, which shall be in those days. Verse 18, and the judges shall make diligent inquisition, and behold, if the witness be a false witness, and hath testified falsely against his brother. So, what would happen if there was a false allegation? It had to be brought between the priests and the judges, and they would deal with the matter and make their judgment, okay? Um, so in this case, uh, Satan is the accuser and his angels, and uh, they are accusing God the Father, okay, accusing Jesus, and so they also have to be brought before the priests and the judges to deal with the matter. Verse 19, then shall you do unto him as he hath thought to have done unto his brother, so shalt thou put the evil away from among you. So who are the priests and the judges who will deal with Satan's allegation? Okay, Who are they? And we find here in 1 Peter 2 verse 9 that the, that the people of God, the, the disciples, those who submit themselves to Jesus, is, it says here, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So whenever someone repents and gives their life to Jesus, they become a priest, part of a royal priesthood. <clears throat> How about the judges? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Do you know, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Okay. So here the saints, they are not only priests, but the time will come when they shall judge the world along with Jesus. And, and when he judge the world, they will also judge the angels. So this is where Satan and one third of his angels, they will be judged according to this verse by the saints. Okay. So God's people, 
They are the priests and the judges who will do their work to settle this great controversy. They will also vindicate the name of Jesus. All right. Ezekiel 28 verse 17. Here we have the story of Lucifer's fall. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. So it's not just the priest and the judges who will deal with Satan, but, but here according to Ezekiel, um, Satan will be brought before the kings that they may behold him. So who are the kings? Revelation 1 verse 5 and verse 6. And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So here, once again, God's people, those who have been washed from their sins by the blood of Christ, they are also uh, kings and priests. So the whole three combine here. Priests, judges, and kings. God's people are the ones to deal with Satan and his angels and the wicked. Okay. Isaiah 43 verse 10, verse 10, God referring to his people. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. So friends, we are called, God's people are called to be witnesses for God. See, in one sense, God is on trial in the fact that Satan has falsely alleged that, you know, he's not worthy to be God. And this is where you and I, witnesses, they are called into uh, to do their part during court cases and trials, okay? So we have to stand up and witness that Satan is wrong and that God is right. Jeremiah 51 verse 20, Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war, for with thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms okay so here god you know it's the language is getting stronger now along with being priests kings judges uh, witnesses now god says thou art my battle axe okay so in the great controversy god wants you and i on the front line and he wants to use us as weapons of war. <clears throat> okay, the war that is going on, it's not a conventional kind of warfare. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, okay, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. So, brothers and sisters, uh, this is not conventional warfare. We need a special type of armor, and it is the armor of God. The, you find a good description of it in Ephesians chapter 6, 
just read through the whole chapter and uh, because it is a spiritual war first timothy chapter 6 verse 12 fight the good fight of faith lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and has professed a good profession before many witnesses so the fight is a fight of faith if you hold on to the faith you know keep the faith you'll have a good ending victory will you you will have victory that's why it's a good fight okay and it's a good fight because when god is on your side who can go against you second corinthians chapter 10 verse 3 for though we walk in the flesh we do not war after the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through god to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of god and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of christ so friends we see that the this war the the great controversy there's two fronts you got the outside front where you're battling against the forces of evil spiritual wickedness in high places uh, adversary satan and his angels okay, that's one part and inside you're battling against self against your own self okay bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of christ and this war has to be done simultaneously outside and inside only then can we have the victory second timothy 2 verse 6 the husbandman that laboreth must be first partakers of the fruits okay so when we go out and take the gospel we also must be partaking of the fruits of that gospel okay uh, otherwise we'll be like a lamppost showing people the way but ourselves we do not walk in that same way okay <clears throat> genesis chapter 3 in verse 15 uh, we have a prophecy here the first prophecy of the messiah in the bible right in the right after the fall when god is speaking to satan okay he says and i will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel okay so this this is an amazing thing that because god knows the ending from the beginning we already know the outcome of the great controversy right from the garden of eden right from this prophecy god is already establishing who's gonna win and who's gonna lose and he's telling Satan here that I will put enmity. Enmity is another word for war between you, the devil, and the woman. Now in the Bible, the woman is symbolic for God's church. And between thy seed, okay, all of those who want to follow Satan, and her seed. Later we'll find out who's the seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman shall bruise Satan's head. Now when the head gets bruised, you know, that's serious. That's, uh, that's you know, fatal. 
and you, the devil, shall bruise his heel. <clears throat> so one thing we can see right here, the seed of a woman is male, his. And he will, his heel will get bruised. So it's going to be like wounded, like a temporary thing. But the Satan's demise will be permanent because he will get bruised in his head. So the seed of the woman will bruise Satan's head. Question, who is the seed of the woman? Galatians chapter 3, verse 6. Now to Abraham and his seeds were the promises made. And he saith not, and to seeds as of many, so it's not plural, just one, but as of one. And thy seed, which is Christ. Okay? So the seed of the woman is Jesus. And uh, so this is the thing. Now, there's only one seed. Okay? Only one seed. But Christ's people, they are many. So what? So how it will work out is that as Christ abides in each one of his, his people, you know, the seed will dwell in each one of his people. So there will be many soldiers for Christ, but one seed. And it says here, that Jesus is the one that will bruise Satan's head. Next question. How will Christ bruise Satan's head? Okay. How will he do it? Romans chapter 16, verse 19. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So the answer to the question Jesus, God, will bruise Satan's head under the feet of the saints. Can you see your part in the great controversy? Can you see where God wants to use you? He wants to use your feet to bruise Satan's head. And, and if you back up to verse 19, how will you do it? For your obedience is come abroad unto all men we can only do it god can only use us if we are obedient to him that's the bottom line if if we are continually disobedient then we we are disqualified we can't lose anything okay but when we are obedient unto God, then God can use us to bruise Satan's head under our feet. Now, why the feet? What does the feet signify? Ephesians chapter 6 verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So the feet signifies the taking of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel. Okay? So it is the preaching of the gospel. And in our context at the end of this world, the three angels' message that will bring down the kingdom of darkness, that will expose the lies 
of Satan and his angels. And this is what will bruise the head of the serpent. Great Controversy, page 606. The sins of Babylon will be laid open. The fearful results of enforcing the observances of the church by civil authority, the inroads of spiritualism, the stealthy but rapid progress of the papal power, all will be unmasked by these solemn warnings the people will be stirred. Thousands upon thousands will listen who have never heard words like these. Okay? And so, this is all part of the gospel. The three angels' messages. See, notice the fearful results of enforcing the observance of the church by civil authority. Think Sunday law. When the church observe Christian church, when they observe Sunday law, which is the mark of the papacy, okay? And when they link it up, when they enforce it by civil authority, all these will be unmasked even before thing happens. That's why when we're giving out the national Sunday law, it's all in there, all the prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation, okay? All this is part of the gospel. Of the first of the first, second, and third angels' message. And when it is brought out as clear Bible truth, you know, what's Satan gonna say? No more excuse. Testimonies, volume six, page nineteen. The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other to prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of God which will close the work of the third angel. You see, friends, in the third angel's message, of Revelation chapter 14, the last part of the third angel's message is verse 12. That's the conclusion. And verse 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Right there you have Righteousness by faith. Righteousness is defined by the, the laws of God. All thy laws, all thy commandments are righteousness. And, and they have the faith of Jesus. You see, friends, when we have the faith of Jesus, then we can keep the commandments of God. And this is the final message that this world needs to hear and to learn. Because Satan is already saying right from the very beginning that the commandments of God cannot be kept. Impossible. And so God is looking for a people to vindicate his name, to prove Satan wrong, that through their own example and their own lives, they that they are keeping the commandments of God with the faith of Jesus. And friends, you cannot have the faith of Jesus if Jesus is not dwelling in your heart. Okay? He's got to be inside through his Holy Spirit. Then we be able to have the faith of Jesus. And this is and so God is calling us now. Come on. This is the final part of the great controversy. As you see the signs and and the prophecies being fulfilled today. We're running out of time fast. So God is looking. Where is my witnesses? Where are my witnesses? 
Where's my battle axe? Who want to be part of the battle axe? Okay. All right. Christ object lessons, 415 and 416. The last message of mercy is to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory in their own life and character. They are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. See, all, all this is part of vindicating God's name. Okay? And the, and the last message of mercy is a revelation of God's character in our lives. And uh, I, I, I have friends. You know, I look at medical missionary work. It's the perfect vehicle to reveal God's love. I mean, when you healing those who are suffering and when you help in their healing and the recovery and you sharing to them when they're down, you know, mentally they're depressed, they emotionally they're just, you know, struggling. And then you, when you just share with them the words of life, the Bible, and you minister to their physical needs, uh, in, in, in doing so, you know, the first thing that comes to their mind is, why is he acting like this? Why is he doing this to me? Why is he helping me? You know? And, and many people that I come across here in the clinic, you know, where, during their testimonies and the feedback that we get from them, the only thing they say is, oh, this is because of the God they serve. That's why they're doing this thing. This is, what, what they're doing is a reflection of the God that they serve. And friends, you don't have to have a big clinic or something to do this kind of thing. Just in the little ways to our neighbors, to our work colleagues, to our friends, as we witness to them of God's love and we help them with their infirmities and their struggles, you know, that's how we are witnessing for Christ and manifesting his glory. That's what it means to be a missionary, to take the gospel, not just the spoken word, but with the life, the gospel in practice. Okay. Romans chapter 8 in verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Friends, when you look around the world, the whole of creation is groaning. Okay? Nature, the plants, the birds, the animals, all of nature combined. The sin, not only sin, not only affects the human race, but the whole world. All the corruption is accumulating and everything is suffering. And what will put an end to the suffering? What will put an end to the great controversy? Verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. All of them the whole world are waiting for God's people to manifest his character. And that will put an end to the great controversy. Okay. And then God can come again. Jesus can return to this earth, put an end to everything. And so this is the high calling. This is God's purpose for man. I have made man for my glory, he says. This is how we can glorify God. You see, God's glory is his character. And when 
his character becomes our character, okay? Then, then all of Satan's allegations fall flat, okay? So we, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, receive not the promise. Okay, now Hebrews chapter 11 is the pantheon of faith. All the men of faith of old, champions of truth in, in the past, um, many of them are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. Abraham, Noah, uh, Elijah, Enoch, okay, Abel, they all there. And, and to sum it up, some chapter summarize Hebrews chapter 11. It says all of these people, they all had a good report through their faith but they have not yet received the promise, okay? The promise of everlasting life, the promise of a mansion in, uh, of a room in heaven, or staying in the new earth, in the new Jerusalem. That promise not yet fulfilled. So what, what is holding it back? Verse 40, God having provided some better thing for us, that they, without us, should not be made perfect. Okay? So most of these people are still lying in their graves, and they are still everything is on hold until until uh, God, having provided some better thing for us, that they, without us, should not be made perfect. Okay. So everything is on hold until God's people in the last generation when they manifest God's character and then you can go on to the next stage. Okay? And then you can have the second coming, the resurrection. So this is what everything is hinging on. That God's people to stand up, vindicate God's name and then all those who are still waiting in their graves, God's people, then they can be resurrected. Matthew chapter 24 in verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Okay. Notice the sequence, the last sign before the end of the world is the gospel of the kingdom to be preached in all the world, okay? For a witness, and might I add, when it's preached through oral, oral through the words and through the life, okay? For a witness witnessing for God, then shall the end come. Okay? Once again, the end will come when God's people manifest His character. The gospel, remember the gospel signified by the feet? And this is how God will use His battle axe as they bruise the head of the serpent with the feet, with the gospel feet. And friends, so this is the high calling that God has for each one of us today. God is calling us. And it's a high calling because it is, we are being called from the big style of sin right to the cutting edge or the front line of the great controversy. And so you choose, you know, many times, we go on the defensive because of the suffering and and confusion and turmoil going on you know we get very defensive our backs against the wall and all but god wants to take us and put us right on the front we got to be proactive we've been reactive for a long time okay 
God wants you and I to be on the front line. And uh, and so and so that's why everything is on hold now. So will you respond to his entreaties? Friends, I believe we are running out of time and uh, we each have to make our stand. The God is knocking at the door of our hearts. Now, this is the same Jesus. 2,000 years ago, he came and died for us so that we could be redeemed. This is the same one who was faithful all the way, even up to the death of the cross, so that you and I could have a place in his kingdom. Now the question is, will we be faithful to him the same way that he has been faithful to us? And that's the question each one of us have to settle. According to the lessons, to the messages, to the seven churches, we are living in the time of Laodicea, which is the really the most miserable of the whole seven churches. They got no, no strengths in that message. Just weakness after problem after weakness. But we praise the Lord that out of the weakest generation, God can pull his people like a brand from the fire and use them as his battle axe. Okay? And it is in this time, out of the very one, weakest one of all, that God wants to pull his champions out. Will you be part of the movement? It is my hope and my prayer that each one of us will be faithful to God the same way he has been faithful to us. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the great love that you have for mankind, great love that you have for us. And Father, I pray that in these times of uncertainty, that you may help us to focus on your truth alone and not to be tainted by the world, but to be pliable instruments in your hands. We commit our lives into your hands. Father, we believe. Help us in our unbelief. Strengthen us, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.